Uh, also, just to introduce my colleague, Ricky, who is moderating the discussion today, you'll see there's a Q&A box um, where you can post questions. We'll be either answering those directly through the uh, message function, or we will be um, answering those at various intervals throughout the presentation. So feel free to post away. Um, and you can also chat um, to amongst yourselves as well. So uh, let's get started. So welcome. So today, um, what we're going to be covering off is looking at a brief look at what is the potential for disruption to the red meat market. We'll also be reviewing what the future might look like if disruption occurs, and we'll be discussing potential responses for the New Zealand red meat sector. Um, so the first question is, is um, alternative protein likely to disrupt the red meat market? So the, the answer to this question, really, the short answer is yes, it is probable. We know that it's probable because whenever disruption occurs, it's preceded by a series of signals or forces that gain momentum and get stronger and start to converge at the same time. I know um, that you've all had a lot of stuff in the press recently in New Zealand, as well as um, in, in the US where I am. Um, so what we're really seeing is that this momentum is gaining and um, they are starting to converge, which suggests that disruption is uh, probable. There are seven forces of disruption, um, and I'm gonna take you really briefly through each of these. These go through a lot more detail in the written report, if you would like to um, look at them uh, in your own time. And of course, again, please post questions um, as they come up. So the, the first force that we're seeing is uh, government and global institutions putting the impact of meat consumption on the agenda. So what we're really seeing here is that a conversation has basically started between different countries around the world where they're talking about what impact red meat is having on their economies, on their um, medical systems and on climate change. Um, and really what this is, why this is important is just simply the fact that they're actually starting to have this conversation. They're starting to take actions to protect their economic interests. They're also starting to, to question some of the benefits of eating red meat or um, consuming red meat and what that has on their uh, environment uh, and their economies. And they're starting to have conversations about reviewing dietary guidelines. So the key thing here is that progress is gonna be slow because governments don't move that fast. However, the point is that they are actually talking about this. The second uh, force that we're seeing is what's happening in the medical industry. And really what, what's really happening here is that they're starting to pit red meat against plant protein. So um, what they're sort of saying is that a pro-plant pro protein diet is good and a, a high red meat diet is less good. Um, and this is happening from the international medical community, as well as mainstream health and wellness industry, as well as healthcare industries, such as the insurance companies and, and large hospitals. Um, so what this is resulting in is that a plant-based diet is gaining momentum and going mainstream. Next, we've got um, the flow of capital. So what we're really talking about here is that there's a steady flow of investment from big foods. And when we talk about big foods, what we mean are big companies like PepsiCo, uh, p and Unilever, Tyson Foods, and some other big meat, meat companies, um, Campbell's, uh, Heinz, Kraft, all of the big ones, um, as well as VCs and philanthropic investors like Bill Gates uh, are investing in looking at alternative sources of protein. Uh, they've got a lot of money to spend and they're continuing to spend money. And ultimately this is feeding the development of these alternative proteins. And what's important here as well is that, especially from the philanthropic investors, is that they have a, an interest in um, that is not an economic interest. So they're happy to lose money in the short term in order to um, do something bigger, which they believe is really important, which is being able to find a solution for feeding the planet. And then of course, with big meat companies like Tyson, um, as well as the big food companies like PepsiCo and Unilever, um, investing in this space is that they're bringing their expertise in uh, building brands and distribution. The other force we're seeing here is um, the uh, development of the, the technology itself. So this is the food technology. The thing to, to point out here is that the technology to produce a consumer-ready alternative, um, known as the protein burger, um, 
is here and is pushing for commercial scale. I've got a, a little bit of extra detail on this because some of the questions we received in advance of the webinar today were specifically around this. Um, so first of all, um, just to give you an overview, there are three core approaches to developing alternative proteins. The first one is uh, synthetic meat. There are two ways in which synthetic meat is happening. So first of all, synthesized meat rather is um, using alternative protein sources to create a product that is considered to be indistinguishable from the animal product itself. There are two ways this is happening uh, and two market leaders within this. One is um, Beyond Meat, creating the Beyond Burger. And what they're doing is that they're mixing uh, plants uh, together um, and adding other ingredients to create a patty that looks similar to a meat patty. And then the other company that is um, leading the charge here in the synthesized meat is Impossible Foods. And what they're doing is they're extracting the protein molecules from the plants and then reconstructing them and building a product from the protein molecules up. So that's one of the approaches. The second approach is the cultured meat, which is one of the ones that gets a lot of press because it's meat that's literally grown in a lab. This is using stem cell technology. So it's um, medical uh, technology to use this um, and what they're doing is extracting stem cells from uh, for example cow muscle tissue and then they're adding um, growth inducing chemicals so that they can multiply and they're literally growing uh, muscle tissue. The third type of approach is um, using uh, novel alternatives. Um, these are things like crickets um, and algae and what we're doing here is that they're um, sourcing or they're farming this novel protein and then they're using a process of fermentation or um, roasting to ground these uh, products into a fine powder and then using it as an ingredient to add to other foods. So they're the three uh, different approaches to developing alternative proteins that are currently available. The thing that we need to be aware of though is that it's likely that this technology will fragment. Um, as the technology evolves and as new novel sources are discovered and as uh, new hybrids become available. Um, what we're also seeing happening in, here in the food technology area is that um, the technology itself is getting cheaper and cheaper. So to give you an example there, you've got the, the lab-grown beef patty has dropped um, in cost uh, to $11.36 from th over 300 grand. Um, and this is at a proof of concept stage. Um, so it's not available in the market, but the, the key point here is that the costs of, of actually doing this are dramatically um, reducing. Um, we're also seeing um, the availability of uh, Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger uh, gaining momentum in grocery stores, um, in casual dining restaurants, in burger places, um, as well as you know, vegetarian restaurants and, and what have you. And that's happening um, in the United States as well as um, in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, you know, the trajectory is that they'll continue to, um, to increase their distribution. And you've got uh, consumers uh, you know, taking an interest in these and are curious about them and are, are buying these products both in the grocery store as well as in um, the dining, uh, the casual dining environments. Um, so really what that's all telling us is that these alternate protein burgers, um, the technology is there, it's gaining traction, and they're continuing to grow and push for more and more commercial scale. Um, the other force that we're seeing here is that of um, new influences. So this is what's coming at a cultural narrative level. So we're seeing professional athletes advocating performance and health benefits of a plant-based diet, um, we've got pop culture driving awareness and shaping the conversation um, that's highlighting the health and sustainability issues of eating red meat. And we've got some aspirational influences that are really um, making the conversation cool and creating followers. And in countries like China, where celebrity is such a powerful force, um, it's, it's making them even more excited and interested um, in this. So the, the real point here is that what's happening is that what used to be a, a niche conversation specifically around animal rights has now actually become um, a more of a mainstream conversation that touches on a number of issues. And um, you've got some people in popular culture that are very influential and perceived to be cool that are, are really driving that conversation. 
Uh, the other thing that we're seeing is a change in eating happen eating patterns. Um, this is obviously being largely driven by the millennials. The millennials are an enormous force um, that uh, are reshaping the food industry and the way that we eat around the world. Some of the um, things to sort of flag here are things like the growth of flexitarianism, um, which is basically people who um, have reduced the amount of meat that they consume um, and or reduce it to say one or two meals a week and the rest of the time they're eating vegetables. Um, you've got 4 billion people in the world that already live on a plant-based diet. Um, you've got things like we're seeing in social uh, media, for example, that you know, words like vegan and vegetarianism are mentioned more than Coca-Cola. Um, so the whole sort of thing that's happening here is that we're changing the way that we eat, um, what we eat and why we eat things. And this whole movement is moving away from red meat. The other thing that we're seeing is that red meat is becoming more specialised and is seen as a comfort food for special occasions or for health reasons. And uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, it has a specific role that it plays. So what this means is that people are um, not only reducing the amount of um, red meat that they're consuming, but the actual number of occasions or the frequency uh, in which people who traditionally do eat red meat is also reducing. So what's sort of happening too is that um, consumer attitudes towards red meat is revealing a number of negative perceptions around it. From the health side of things, um, we're seeing people believe that red meat is bad for their heart, um, that it's got steroids in it, um, that it leads to uh, lethargy, that um, as I sort of said in Chinese medicine, it um, has limited use within that, so it's naturally restricted. Uh, the Chinese are also very aware of the Western views um, from the medical community on red meat, which is making them rethink it. And you've got um, people, for example, in the UK who are, you know, over 50% of people are, are citing their reason for reducing red meat consumption is due to health concerns. So there's some health issues around um, red meat. Um, we also have welfare issues around uh, red meat, which I know I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, that um, is, is gaining momentum because what you've got is um, some of the videos on Netflix and what have you are really um, getting a lot of exposure um, and they're you know, pitching this industry as being cruel and dirty and if the animals are treated poorly, there's a belief that the meat itself will be unhealthy. Uh, there's also um, a lot of celebrity around this. Um, so the, the welfare industry, uh, the, sorry, the welfare issues regarding animals is also one of the reasons why there's some negative uh, perceptions. Um, finally, there's the environment, which is possibly one of the, the biggest ones that's happening at the moment. Um, and this is where uh, some of the alternative protein companies are, are really uh, capitalizing on this narrative that's taking place, um, where um, people are very concerned about the environment and the effect that raising livestock and uh, producing meat for consumption is having on the environment. It's being made worse by the fact that you have, for example, um, other environmental impacts are really being felt. Um, in California recently, we had the, the bushfires, which were the, the worst in, um, in recorded history, which has caused a lot of discussion here. Um, pollution is a big issue in China. Um, so this, the environment in general is a conversation that's taking place and understanding the impact that raising livestock has on the environment is a really easy uh, narrative for consumers to grasp. Um, the other thing to think about here is that we're seeing the acceptance of alternative protein um, varying, of course, but perhaps being a little bit more positive than you might think. So um, on the synthetic meat side, so these are things like the Impossible Burger and um, the uh, Beyond Burger. These are seen as being healthier, as being more sustainable, as being a good substitute. And because they're made from plants, they're being seen as a, a natural alternative. Conversely, if you look at the, um, the lab-grown meat or the synthetic meat, um, there are some questions around this. People are curious, um, but there are some questions around what the long-term side effects might be. Uh, are they genetically modified? Are there chemicals in here? But people are curious about it and there's a, an acceptance that perhaps one day this will have to become a reality because of the environmental issues, for example. And then when we look at novel protein sources, um, things to bear in mind here is that 
for many people in the world, they're already eating this and it's already part of their diet. So it just seems like a normal thing to do. Um, for people in the Western world, they're aware of people eating it in other countries. Um, so perhaps they don't want to munch on a cricket per se, but um, the idea of getting their protein um, from another source or being in a powdered form that doesn't affect the, the taste of something is also something that people are curious and okay with. The um, next one we've got is um, looking at the market response. So this is um, our last force that we're seeing. And what's really happening here is that the market's responding to this conversation that's happening with consumers, to, to the demand that consumers have and their different needs and desires for alternative sources of protein. Um, the key thing to sort of ooh, to take away here is um, the fact that um, we're seeing um, the growth in the uh, grocery store, in the distribution, in mainstream grocery stores, as well as uh, the number of SKUs that are available. And one of the inter interesting statistics that one of the experts we spoke to um, talked about the fact that while the volume of um, alternative protein, such as Beyond Burger, was small, the growth was huge. They're experiencing 40% plus growth. Um, which um, they thought was very interesting and exciting and suggests that there's a real demand for that. And then, of course, with those big food companies coming into um, this space, it's, they're really seeing a, an, an increase in sophistication and the way that they um, are um, marketing themselves and attracting consumers. Um, so there are our seven um, forces for disruption. Um, and before I start talking about um, what... Um, disruption might look like. Um, we're just gonna just answer some of the questions that we have received. Okay, so our first question is, um, do we think there's a significant difference between the East and West in their response to alternative proteins? Um, oh, actually, before I answer this, if while I'm answering these questions, if you haven't posted your question yet, please do so, and we will make sure we get to it. Um, so uh, to answer this question, so in the West, um, they're further along in adopting a reduction in red meat and, um, and also trying and adopting these alternative proteins. However, the thing to consider is that the East is actually very open to these alternative proteins. They're excited about them because of that celebrity involvement. And then of course, they're much more open to the novel sources. Um, so, as I said in summary, is there a significant difference? Um, it's more about the, the life stage or the, the cycle at which they've adopted the uh, alternative proteins and started reducing red meat. Um, okay, so, um, sorry, Ricky's just sending me all the questions. Cool. Um, great. Okay. So um, as we keep going, um, please feel free to add any questions. Um, so I've lost control. Cool. So um, the next thing is what do we think the world would look like if disruption would actually occur? Um, and what I'm going to um, show you here is um, a video in a second. So we have developed four plausible scenarios of what the world could look like in the event that disruption takes place. These four scenarios bring to life four ways the world could change in the future. We're going to take a look at each and understand how alternative protein could disrupt the world of red meat. Our first scenario is called, red meat is pushed to the side of the plate. A combination of consumer concerns around meat and government restrictions around production have hit red meat hard, with environmental health and welfare concerns leading to people cutting down. In this world, farms have changed. Now everyone grows alternative proteins such as plant-based protein, which is seen as healthier and better for the environment, as well as other alternatives such as insect protein. It tastes just as good as red meat, so the alternative protein business is booming. This isn't a meat-free world, but red meat is now just used for medical and nutritional purposes, given only to those who need it. This scenario isn't as far-fetched as you might think. We already see everyday people voicing concerns about red meat.
To recap, in this world we have consumers turning away from red meat due to a variety of concerns, governments restricting red meat production and distribution, producers of alternative protein have successfully created a range of products and consumers love the taste. Traditional red meat is now primarily used for medical purposes. Next we have a scenario called red meat is a specialty choice. In this world, everybody still wants red meat, but they can't have it. Governments have restricted red meat, so it has become very expensive. So now red meat is just for special occasions and the rich. And red meat has become a high margin luxury business with multiple tiers of value and new high-end products thriving. The governments are promoting alternative proteins. So it's become an affordable, albeit less desirable way to get protein. Some people are already seeing meat as a specialty choice, a luxury item. So in this world we see Consumers still think red meat is delicious and desirable. Governments are restricting red meat and promoting alternative protein. Because of these two forces, red meat becomes a luxury item, only for special occasions in the rich. An alternative protein is left to provide an affordable way to get protein. Let's move on. To red meat is a reluctant choice. Here the government is supporting the meat industry and promoting red meat. But consumers are rejecting red meat due to health, environment, and welfare concerns leading to conflict. Alternative protein producers haven't been able to create something scalable or tasty enough for consumers, so it hasn't taken off. Although the meat industry is still doing well and producing plenty of food, most people are trying to reduce their consumption of red meat. Even today we see people who are already seeing red meat as a reluctant choice, struggling with red meat but don't feel they are ready to switch to plant protein. This is a world in which consumers are rejecting red meat because of a variety of concerns from health to the environment. Governments are protecting the red meat industry and promoting red meat. Consumers eat less and less red meat, looking for other options, but they feel trapped as alternatives are too expensive or unsatisfying. Now let's take a look at our final scenario. This is red meat is the everyday choice. In this world, red meat is abundant and there has been no backlash. Governments have protected red meat the meat industry is booming, particularly in markets where the population is growing. So meat is cheap and competition in the market is fierce. Negative press around red meat has been disproven or ignored, and alternative proteins have failed to take off, and most go out of business. We see signs of this scenario in the attitudes of some people today. So when red meat is the everyday choice, consumers have ignored negative press and a growing population makes it essential. The demand for red meat leads to fierce competition between new and existing players. There are no restrictions on red meat production and no government support for alternative proteins. So alternative proteins are still small, something that only a few care about. These are four potential future scenarios. Red meat is pushed to the side of the plate. Red meat is a specialty choice. Red meat is a reluctant choice, and red meat is the everyday choice. Okay, great. So they are our um, four scenarios. So the reason why we um, create uh, these scenarios and, and explore scenarios is that it helps us think about what the future could look like in a structured way. Um, they give us an idea about what, how consumers might be behaving, what they might be thinking, how they might be responding, what the governments might be doing, gives us a little bit of a window, if you like, into the future so that we can monitor the forces that we've shared, so that we can start to take action today, and that we can protect ourselves against what might be coming in the future. Um, 
we've actually show them as if you like almost a little like almost like the extremes like the outer edges and um and in reality not one of these as a single thing will take place but there'll be some sort of a version of these and so we use these to help us um get a bit of a feel for what the future could look like so that we can prepare the other thing about scenarios that's really interesting is that um, whilst this is happening in the red meat industry it's not happened um this isn't the first time that it's happened um it also has happened in other industries um so we're going to have a look at those so oh, these four scenarios great so um what might each of these scenarios look like in um reality so i'm just going to take you through um some case studies that help um ground us in what this sort of scenarios might look like in another industry. Um, so the first one that we're going to look at is um, the scenario of red meat is pushed to the side of the plate. So we don't have an example of um, where this has actually happened yet, but what we do have um, is an example from the dairy industry. So the dairy industry offers us a cautionary tale of what can happen um, if a scenario like uh, milk getting is, is getting pushed to the, the side of the plate. So just to sort of remind ourselves a little bit about where this has come from. So milk was, has historically been a staple in, in every home. Um, families had it at the dinner table, um, kids drank it, uh, adults drank it, teenagers drank it, everybody did. And dairy farmers were protected and supported, supported by government regulations and subsidies. And the milk and dairy industry was growing. It was really hard for anyone to imagine a time when we wouldn't be, be drinking milk. It was as um, common, if you like, as water and, and oxygen and as necessary in our lives. What we saw happen though was that a series of forces collided that shifted the market. Um, a new generation emerged where they were replacing milk consumption with soft drinks. Um, we had um, health advocates um, building a case against dairy um, that eventually started to get adopted. Uh, government started to reduce their support um, and eventually the dietary guidelines were also changed to reduce the amount of, of dairy and milk that was required or recommended. Um, so what started out as being something that was um, slow or niche um, and seemed unlikely, it actually gained a lot of momentum. So we initially had um, one core alternative, which was almond milk. Um, it was historically used for, um, for niche conditions like lactose intolerance. Um, but these alternatives got better, the technology fragmented, um, more and more players came into the market, they started to offer different benefits, they started looking at different types of nuts, um, from cashews and walnuts to pistachio to create even more products, and then eventually it actually moved beyond milk and into yogurt and even cheese. So to, to kind of put this in perspective, um, almond milk is now America's favourite milk substitute. It's boasting sales growth of over 250% in the last five years. Um, and during the same uh, exponential growth, the total milk market um, shrunk by more than a billion dollars. So it just gives you a bit of a feel for what can happen um, when um, consumers shift away from eating what, uh, or in this case, drinking milk, which nobody could imagine happening. The other thing to take into consideration here is that this all happened despite a really strong headwind, which was the health scare that came with regard to soy. So the, it still happened regardless. The um, things that we can learn from this, there are several things we can learn. Um, one is about the importance of collaboration. So the, the dairy industry really missed out on huge revenue opportunities and they were slow to respond and they didn't come together as a group. Um, they are doing that now, which I'm going to talk about um, a little later in the session. Um, but at the time that this started happening, they didn't do anything. They didn't come together. The other thing that we can learn from this is the importance of watching the signals. So these weak signals were there um, and they just continued on business as usual and never expected the disruption to take place. Uh, also, we can learn here about new competition. So outside players that they never imagined came into the industry and captured share. Um, these were big food companies, actually, um, were one of the big examples here. Um, some technology companies, so people they didn't even think about considering as being the competition came in and took share from them. 
the other thing we can learn here is about avoiding a defensive strategy. So right now the dairy industry is on the defensive and they have to try and um, reduce appeal to almond milk um, through attack campaigns rather than being able to find positive new ways to appeal con to consumers, which is you know, a much harder strategy. So that's um, an example of what happened to um, the dairy industry when um, red meat was pushed to the side of the plate or for them when uh, milk was pushed to the side of the plate. The next one is bringing to life what it would look like for um, if, if red meat became a specialty choice. So our example here is um, in the bottled water industry. So consumers were looking for um, a really convenient and easy way to replace tap water and sugary drinks. Um, and the, the consumer packaged goods companies came at this with, uh, with loads. They were launching a lot of bottled water. Um, there was a lot of um, new um, filtered water and, and different types of water that were available and consumers were adopting this in droves because of the convenience of um, having um, the water available to them. Um, what we saw though was that there was a narrative that occurred about the impact that was happening to the environment and plastics happening to the environment. So what was what resulted was that um, people were uh, reducing their consumption of bottled water because they were mindful of the, the social pressure that they were getting. Um, and of course, governments also started to crack down on plastic. So consumers were reducing their consumption of bottled water, which meant that the bottled water in order to survive had to do something. And what they did was they um, remained relevant by um, a, jumping on the bandwagon with regard to health trends. So um, don't go back to soda, you should stay with water because you need to be reducing your um, sugar intake. Uh, they also created a premium position to um, pitch themselves against um, uh, alcohol and for special occasions. They also um, introduced new benefits. So they had uh, different levels of carbonation became available to provide different taste experiences. Um, they introduced new performance benefits such as um, electrolytes um, in smart water. And then of course, um, there was a, a big investment in packaging to really premiumize the, um, the products. And finally, they also created a, a story around scarcity um, with things like Icelandic water or you know, water that came from a glacier and what have you. Um, so ultimately what this ended up resulting in is that we have multiple tiers of value within um, the bottled water category. And what you can see there is uh, bottled water that costs as much as $14 um, through to limited edition bottled water that costs as much as $100,000. So um, that's a, a pretty impressive thing that they did um, when um, in their case, uh, water became um, something that was a specialty item. So there are several things we can learn from this industry as well. Um, with this story as well. One is holding the course. So the bottled water industry were okay about losing volume. They focused their investment on creating new reasons and giving consumers um, a, a different benefits and a reason to pay even more than they had before for water. They accepted some loss. So they let go of the low margin um, opportunities and they let consumers shift to tap water at home instead of aggressively defending against it. Uh, they created new benefits. So this was where I was talking about adding things to the ingredients or um, different levels of carbonation, giving them benefits that they couldn't get from tap water. So they had to, to purchase water for some occasions. Um, and then also they um, did a massive repositioning. So their strategy was very focused on positioning themselves against new competitors, um, specifically um, alcohol. And in some restaurants, they actually have um, water sommeliers. The next one um, is red meat is the reluctant choice. So um, here we have um, the example of uh, the, sh the soda or the soft drink industry. So the soft drink industry um, was at a time when um, consumers were reluctantly choosing to have this because there weren't any other alternatives available. They didn't like the taste of, of, of water um, and didn't want to drink alcohol and what have you. So um, what we had was that sugary drinks were still being consumed by consumers, but they weren't um, that happy about doing it. Um, 
companies like Coke had a very streamlined portfolio with just different SKUs of, of different soft drink that were all pretty much the same except for different flavors. The government turned a, a complete blind eye um, to this with regard to the, the sugar that was in it. And it's only recently um, that they actually started introducing a uh, sugar tax. And uh, to put this in perspective, they, no regulation happened for almost 15 years. Um, so um, consumers were adopting this strong health narrative around reducing soft drink and soda consumption. Um, and so what initially happened was that they just, they just avoided it altogether. And then ultimately what happened was the soft drink companies got um, wise to this. And um, if you take, for example, Coke, uh, Coke diversified initially launching Dasani, um, which was their uh, purified water brand. They, um, also acquired um, other um, soft drink alternatives like Innocent, which is a, a fruit smoothie. Um, they also acquired Smart Water, um, which has an additional benefit to it. They also created an incubator to um, come up with new healthier drinks, which is where the Zyco coconut water came from. And then ultimately they even replaced um, their core product being Coke and Diet Coke with Coke Zero. So they could create a sugar-free option. So um, they have also relaunched themselves as a, a the Coca-Cola company that are, are bigger than just Coke. So what can we learn from this particular um, example? So it's a staged approach. So Coke didn't diversify overnight. They did it in incremental stages and through a variety of revenue streams. And they used all of this revenue to fund new, new development to their core product. They listened to the signals. So as I said, diversification didn't happen immediately um, and they were kept an eye on what was happening with the, the, uh, the different forces. And the key point is they took the shift in demand seriously and they actually plotted a range of strategic moves in order to react to those. They used um, the revenue gains in the short term as well as the growth that they were getting still in the emerging markets um, from the consumption of soft drink to fund uh, long-term activity. So to give you an example, it took five years to develop the sugar-free Coke. Um, and they also um, bought themselves time. So they um, lobbied and, and, and uh, tried to slow down the, the change in the regulation. As I mentioned, it took the government 15 years before they introduced a sugar tax. So they bought themselves time so that they could prepare for this shift that was happening in consumer behavior. Our um, uh, final scenario, which is red meat is the everyday choice. Uh, the wine industry offers a helpful example for this. So um, the wine industry um, is something that um, initially wine was um, only consumed by um, small, uh, small groups of people or was kept for special occasions, but there was a lot of support put behind the wine industry and um, it became a, an item that was consumed every day. Um, and people continued to consume wine, um, despite the fact that there was uh, growing uh, concern with regard to health and whether or not it was a, a good idea that people just kept drinking it. Um, the government continued to support the wine industry um, and um, the wineries continued to benefit from that support. Um, but what also happened though at the same time is that because consumers were continuing to drink wine despite the fact that there was all this evidence saying it wasn't a good idea, um, what we've seen is a lot of consolidation taking place in the industry um, and uh, the markets become really, really competitive. Uh, we've also seen um, new countries into entering into the wine production business, like India and China, for example, have um, vineyards now. Um, and of course, everyone is trying to take advantage of the growth in population and as people continue to drink wine. So it's getting more and more competitive because it's attractive. And then there is a bit of a lag effect um, because these people have got to learn to drink wine and um, get to the legal drinking age. So um, what we can learn from this is that some of the, the success that you might see um, when you've got a scenario where um, something is still um, the everyday choice is that the, the actual growth itself um, is not, looks really good on the surface, but when you dig beneath it, it's actually not as attractive as you might think. So in the wine industry, for example, we've seen a lot of producers struggling to compete. There's been a lot of consolidation and the margins are getting lower and lower. Uh, it's become highly competitive, so it's really 
um, made it even more difficult to um, succeed um, and to generate the margins that you need. Um, we've also seen the growth itself in this adoption has been slow, especially as where they're entering into new markets like China, um, where they have to train people um, to, to drink wine and, and adopt it, or you've got to wait for the next generation to emerge. And they're also um, quite vulnerable because they assumed that every generation would come through and that they would drink wine like their parents did. And for example, what we're seeing in millennials is that they're actually shifting to craft beer and these wineries don't have a diversified portfolio to protect them against that. So as I mentioned um, before, um, that hopefully gives you a bit of a picture for what the, the four scenarios can look like in real life. And there's lessons that we can learn from those. Um, in reality, not one of those signal, sing, single scenarios will happen in isolation. It's gonna be somewhere more like a, a mashup that's in the middle, but we use these as a tool to help us build a picture of what the future could like, look like so that we can prepare for it. So um, how could New Zealand beef and lamb respond? Um, what we have um, developed is um, a series of strategic responses. Um, and this is really how you prepare for disruption. So you basically choose a strategic option that fits best with your capabilities and with your brand and business goals as individual farmers, as well as a, as a group of farmers, as well as an industry in New Zealand beef and lamb. Uh, there is a temptation to stick with, oh, let's just prepare and do a little bit of each of them, because if we do a little bit of each of them, we can cover um, all potential um, outcomes or eventualities. The challenge is that some of these um, are actually, uh, and they are at odds with each other, so it's not possible to actually hedge in that way. And then of course, you've also, it's important to make sure that you're focusing your investment and energy in one direction so that you can pull your expertise and resources behind um, a common goal. So the first one that I'm going to talk through is um, a response of expanding and growing share in red meat through differentiation and um, having uh, an aggressive strategy or speed to market. So what's happening in this particular um, strategic response is that the focus is all about targeted expansion, um, capturing new consumers and increasing uh, the volume of existing consumers and moving quickly into these emerging markets. So if you look to where the population growth is, it's in the sub-Sahara in India and in China. So it's really about aggressively going into those markets so that as those people um, come to age where they can make decisions about what they purchase, um, that you are developing product to appeal to those group of consumers. Um, it's important here to make sure that we're aware of what are their needs and what are their behaviors so that you can make sure that you're producing product to appeal to them. Um, what's also happening here is you are um, defending any current share that you've got um, and you're keeping a watchful eye on what's happening elsewhere, be it in alternative protein, be it in the premium space, so that you can sort of protect yourself um, against uh, other activity. Um, and also you might identify there's, there's some quick margin wins that you can make, but really the focus of this strategy is all over here, which is about differentiating and creating new growth opportunities for you. Um, what's really um, interesting about this that you might decide this is the right response for us is first and foremost, because it fits with your capabilities and your goals as an industry and as individual uh, companies. Um, the other thing, reason why you might um, consider this as your strategic response is because you believe that population growth is going to continue to be eating meat um, and that markets that are currently not big meat eaters um, are going to actually adopt Western behaviours and will be eating red meat. Um, and that's sort of the reason why you might consider um, a response such as this. We've got some frameworks for how um, you can start thinking about that. But before I do that, we thought it would be useful to give you an example of how um, this strategy has been executed in the dairy industry. So as I mentioned before, the dairy industry um, initially had not collaborated and they hadn't come together when disruption occurred in the dairy industry. And what we're now seeing is that they are in fact coming together um, and they're hitting back at their declining uh, sales 
and coming together to create a coordinated response. They've developed a coordinated communications campaign. Um, you may be familiar with the Got Milk campaign. Um, they've now come back together again. So it's all about Got Dairy or Undeniably Dairy. Um, they are um, very aggressively doing this from all angles. So it's not just about milk, it's about cheese, it's about yogurt, um, promoting all of the benefits that you can get uh, only from dairy. Um, they are also focusing on expansion. So they're working, for example, with the US trade representatives to focus on markets such as Mexico to capture that market. Um, they're also looking at new markets um, in Asia. Um, so for example, exports to Southeast Asia rose 16% and China rose 74% in the first quarter of last year. So they are really taking very um, aggressive action to, to, to try and um, reclaim the, the dairy um, industry and to capitalize on the growth that's happening in other parts of the world, the world from a population standpoint. So there's a couple of things we can learn from this. Um, particular execution of the, uh, the strategic response is that it did require a significant amount of investment. Um, they came together and pooled their financial resources in order to um, create this campaign and to get this government support. Um, they did a lot of work on communication and rebrand positioning and looking for ways of how they could influence the consumer demand and really push a narrative around dairy. And um, the other key thing that we can learn from this is that they had really strong partnerships. They did a lot of investment with both domestic and foreign governments in order to get support. So um, what might this strategic response mean specifically for New Zealand beef and lamb? So the first thing that um, we recommend you have a think about is what is your scorecard, if you like. Um, so, um, how you might actually be able to leverage the strategic response. So it's about looking at what are the strengths that you have individually, um, what are the weaknesses that you have individually, as well as as a group, and then what could be the opportunities that you could leverage, and what are the threats that you need to be mindful of. I'm not going to go through each of these. These are available in the, uh, the full report, but it's really just to give you a bit of a starter for the kinds of things that you might um, populate in um, a SWOT like this. The other thing to um, think about is the types of actions that you would actually have to take place if you were going to execute a strategic response like expand. Um, so in the short term, you'd have to move really quickly to defend um, current share. You'd need to be building these external relationships so that you can get access to these new markets, um, putting a coordinated effort behind whatever strengths that you have as an industry and making sure that all the opportunities were covered. Um, you'd be engaging in consumer research so that you can understand what are the needs of these new markets, um, the consumers in these markets. And in the long term, we'd be looking at how do we expand our offer to appeal to, for example, young people in China and India. You also might be in investing in generating volume through new partnerships um, and uh, looking at, at how innovation and regulation might play out so that you can cover yourself. Some of the, the actions, um, so these have been developed for each of the different um, members of the, uh, the community, but obviously what I've got here is the um, potential implications and actions for farmers. As an industry wide, um, it's about really becoming very, very competitive and moving very quickly to capture those emerging markets. So it's all about collaboration and being focused on speed. And there's an example of some of the types of actions that you may have to take. The actions, of course, are going to be unique to you as individual farmers um, and, and you as an industry, but it gives you a little bit of an idea. So, for example, you might have to invest in different breeds in order to appeal to the, uh, the needs of the new consumers. Um, you might have to pull resources or identify opportunities that exist within a specific region within, for example, China. Um, you may have to educate and upskill up yourselves and become an expert in whatever these new consumers are um, needing. So that gives you a little bit of a flavour. The next strategic response that I'm going to talk about is um, diversifying. Um, oh. So one thing that I just wanted to just reiterate as well is that the um, 
strategic responses don't line up directly against a scenario. So it's not like, oh, this scenario happens, we need to do this. It's more about, as I mentioned, the actual reality will be something that's in the middle. It'll be a mashup of these. It's really about picking the strategic response that fits best with your skills, um, with your capabilities, and with your goals and objectives as, as an industry. So if you decided to explore this scenario, which is diversify, this is about diversifying your portfolio beyond red meat so that you can protect and protecting current share at the same time to power those investments. Um, so it's shifting away from this place where you are big producers of, of red meat and using the revenue that you gain here to invest in some incremental um, opportunities. So it's all about diversification. This might include creating partnerships, having mergers and acquisitions, new product development. Um, it's staged. You might be looking for revenue streams that are outside of traditional red meat sources. Um, you um, might be um, looking at shifting away even from um, farming livestock and selling animal proteins. Um, so it's all about looking for, you know, where are those new opportunities and um, how can I make sure that I continue to protect my share so that I can finance any diversification that I do. Again, you might pick this response if it if it's best suits your goals and your capabilities. And you also would choose this response if you believe that the trend um, in consumers' desire for alternative proteins is going to continue. And that... Um, they're, they're going to be looking for, uh, for, for more tasty options. So this is how the dairy industry executed a strategy like this, or I should say a dairy brand executed this strategy. So Danone, um, a French company, um, they um, were um, a traditional you know, global dairy giant. Um, they'd started to become vulnerable to market shifts. They were having, for example, 40% of their sales um, were coming out of Western Europe and consumer tastes were shifting away from dairy. Um, so they embarked on a strategy of investing in repositioning their portfolio to become focused on health and wellness and they relaunched under the Denone One Planet One Health. They did this by initially, they acquired White Wave Foods. Um, White Wave Foods is um, increased sales by 19% over the last four years, and it's become the fastest growing company in US food and beverage industry. They also um, spent five years repositioning their portfolio and building an end-to-end -end more sustainable value chain with some dairy-free options. They created partnerships with farmers um, and paid for certifications um, so that so for farmers for using non-GMO uh, feed, and they did a, an enormous amount of investment in R&D to create uh, non-dairy and plant-based products, and even a combination of the two as a product. So what can we learn from this group? Um, what we can learn from this example is that um, you do need to respond to shifts in consumer uh, needs and behavior. Um, and, we, and having a, an overarching objective to help reposition yourselves as a group to meet these uh, consumer needs, um, about having a staged change. So this change took over five years um, and it still continues today. It didn't happen overnight. Um, and finally, it's about investing in the long term. So they had to look at all of the different parts of their business and um, where they could potentially um, address any changes. And they looked at everything from the product itself to the supply chain to how they invested in R&D in order to be able to make this a reality. So diversifying is, is obviously one of the, it is one of the harder um, strategies to, to execute. Um, so what might this mean for you? Um, as before, um, first of all, it's about thinking about your strengths and weaknesses as individual farmers, as well as as an industry. Um, are you placed to be able to diversify? Um, you know, one of the things that's great about New Zealand is it's, you know, a small country. And so you know each other, so you can actually come together um, and bring about change more quickly than, say, for example, a country the size of the United States. Um, also looking at this is like thinking about, you know, what are the opportunities that you want to be um, taking advantage of as well as the threats um, that you want to be looking for. So again, you create a, a scorecard that um, is based on you as individual companies as well as, as an industry. Um, 
thinking about some of the actions that might be required. Um, here's some, a selection of some of those um, actions that might take place in the short term as well as the long term. Um, in the short term, you might be doing things like looking at, you know, who's best place for diversification, who could you, which parts could you capture, um, deciding as a group, you know, what is the objective that we want to set, who's best place to do what, um, what resources do people have. And in the longer term, you might be looking at things like, you know, who should be the people that will be best suited to take some of these long term um, uh, bets on some of the, the, the more aggressive, if you like, or innovative areas. Um, again, so in terms of looking at some of the actions, so as an industry, um, it's, this sort of response doesn't work unless you come together as a sector and pull all of your strengths and get behind one core goal or objective. Um, it is, of course, still possible to have separate P&Ls, but your actions need to be coordinated and in the same direction. As farmers, some of the things that a strategy like this would uh, mean for you um, would be that you might be continuing to produce red meat while assessing your assets and looking at different revenue streams that you could create from those, um, exploring opportunities to collaborate with um, other farmers or with big meat companies, um, looking at direct to end user opportunities, and even potentially shifting away from the raising of livestock um, into, for example, um, crops or, or insect farms. The um, next one is about premiumize. Um, and what this particular strategy is all about is um, looking at um, building tiers of value and investing in product development. So what we see here is um, you have um, moving up to this space here, it's all about how do I premiumize my portfolio? How do I um, create these tiers of value? Um, and what we mean by tiers of value is that you have from low premium to super premium. So for example, um, you know, Wagyu might be premium now, but that would be like the low end of it. So this is about super or, or uber, uber, uber premium, a little bit like what we talked about with regard to the uh, water industry. Um, so what we're doing is focusing up here on how do we premiumize our portfolio. You're transitioning away from the low volume the low value and the volume market here, um, because the, the focus is all about pushing the portfolio towards a premium place. Um, and you're keeping a watchful eye on what's happening in the alternative protein sector. So how is Impossible Burger doing? Have they evolved and now producing, for example, uh, muscle tissue to be a steak or, or what have you? Um, this particular... Um, type of response involves a, a focused, coordinated response. Everyone needs to be following the same guidelines for what is premium. Um, it's about investing in, in building the product and the credentials around the product. And over time, it's about adding more and more tiers of value so that you can continue to, to invent and reinvent what the definition of premium is. Um, so it's really about an ongoing investment in the premiumization. So, you might consider this response again, if you, your capabilities and your goals fit to do this. And then as well, if you're believing that consumers are always going to have a, a place in their heart for, for red meat. So an example um, from the dairy industry again. Um, so there is a, a company um, out of Chicago called 1871. Um, 1871 Dairy, um, this is an ultra premium micro um, dairy and they sell direct to consumers. Um, they um, returned to older artisan methods um, of dairy processing. So this is how they were able to justify their uh, premium price point. Um, so they, for example, uh, pasteurized their milk at 145 degrees, which is a lower temperature than many of the commercial uh, processes. And so it can, the benefit they're offering is it's healthier um, for you. Um, they created innovative premium specialty products. Um, you can see their packaging is, is premium and they also have unusual flavors and tastes um, as well. And they also charge a premium. So to give you a frame of reference, um, half a gallon of their milk is $7, which is more than double what the cost is for a regular half gallon of milk. They also um, explored non-traditional distribution channels. So they supply Michelin star restaurants and they sell to specialty 
retailers as well as direct to consumers. So they built different distribution channels. So what can we learn from this group? Um, it really is a low volume, but it's high margin. So this is not a mainstream concept, but as I mentioned, um, their margins are almost double that of a traditional uh, milk um, producer. And so what might something like this look like for yourselves? Um, you're hopefully seeing a pattern now. Um, what does premiumize mean? So from the strengths side of things, um, look at you know, what are the strengths that you have in order to be able to adopt this particular strategy. So you know, we know, for example, that you've got strong red meat credentials and there's momentum gaining in this direction already with the red meat story. Um, and there's, you've got an infrastructure in place. Um, there's some really interesting uh, geography and origin claims that can be made. Um, and then there's already some people that are selling direct to consumer. Um, on the, the weaknesses side of things, there's obviously the livestock from the dairy industry that, that needs to, to find a home in this strategy. Um, and um, the red meat story is only just beginning, so it's early days. Um, but then of course, on the opportunity side of things, there really is, this opportunity for um, a high margin play, um, especially while the protein alternatives are staying in the mince area. And then of course, as meat becomes more scarce, um, then uh, it becomes more and more valued. Uh, and um, the other thing that's sort of interesting, I think on the opportunity side of things is that uh, it's possible that the alternative protein players will stay out of developing muscle. So they will never develop, for example, a steak or a roast. Um, they'll stay in the, the mince area. Some of the threats, of course, we need to be aware of here is that there are other competitors that are positioned to um, offer similar credentials, like, for example, Ireland. Um, and, of course, the consumer demand could shift at, at any moment. So it's something that we need to be watching. Some of the actions that you might be taking here creating, as I sort of said, those premium guidelines, you know, what does premium look like? Um, having a coordinated effort in, in investing and building the premium product. Um, in the longer term, it'd be looking at things like um, investing in product credentials so that you can continue to increase your margin and reinvent what premium means, um, as well as ongoing support for building that strong brand story and creating this feeling of scarcity. What does this mean as an industry? Um, so this does require a significant amount of investment um, in order to premiumize your product um, and also all support those premium guidelines. Um, and it also means that people that don't abide by the, these new guidelines would be excluded from claiming that they're this super premium um, New Zealand source meat. And the thing I just want to make sure that I stress here is that this is super, super premium. So it's much more premium than what we're seeing today. This is an idea of investing and creating, like we saw in that example with regard to the, the water industry, um, where you've got you know, meat that's so premium, it's $100,000 um, as an example. Our last um, strategy that we're going to be um, looking at is um, Innovate. Um, as I'm doing that, I can see that questions are coming in, so keep posting those and we'll make sure we answer those at the end. Okay, so Innovate. Um, this particular strategy is all about optimising any short-term revenue streams that you have in order to invest in long-term innovation. Um, and this is thinking big and beyond what sort of defines the current red meat category. So um, it might be different uses for farmland, it might be different uses for the byproduct of um, the meat industry, or using, for example, uh, livestock in the medical industry, as we see today with um, using different, part, different organs in, human, um, in the human medical industry. Um, it really does require a big paradigm shift. So this is, think about different business models and different ways of working. It really involves expanding your current capabilities and skills. Um, and it does assume at the heart of it is that you are leaving the red meat consumption um, market. So it's moving away from eating red meat or, or producing uh, red meat for human consumption and instead using the meat in other um, forms, like I said, the medical industry or 
using your assets and land um, for other uses, um, whatever they, they might be. Um, it is time dependent, so growth is slow, but once it actually picks up, you accelerate really fast. Um, this is one of those strategies that it is very difficult to decide to do later. So even the future, say, um, you decided not to explore this strategy, and then in the future, tomorrow, overnight, you weren't allowed to produce uh, livestock anymore, you wouldn't be able to do a quick switch and adopt this strategy simply because uh, it requires long-term investment uh, to discover those innovations. Um, if we think about um, how this looked for um, a dairy brand. Um, so this is an example from Elmshurst Dairy, which um, is um, a, a dairy company from uh, upstate New York. Um, this particular company um, had years of financial losses and they were continuing in decline of, of um, their volume in milk consumption. And so what they did was they, in 2016, they closed their milk producing plants. Um, and a year later, they reopened and they had completely shifted their positioning and their business model to focus on vegan nut milks. What they did to make this happen was that they um, recognized what their strengths were and what their weaknesses were. And they had a strength in packaging and distribution, but what they didn't have was, um, uh, proprietary technology. So they teed up with a, a doctor by the name of Dr. Mitchell, and she brought a technology of how you can extract the liquid from um, plants. Um, so they, with that, they invented a proprietary process that they called milking, and they created a new product that they called milked launching initially with almond milks. And then they subsequently went on to launch a range of milks with the most recent one being milked ch chickpeas. They built new distribution channels and premium stores and they also sold direct to consumer. So what we can learn from this is that um, they required a pivot in order to be successful, um, but they were successful. So it is actually possible to shift your entire business um, they did this in a year, which is pretty impressive. Um, but they um, had, of course, been looking for the technology for some years before that. Um, they required outside experts and they brought those, those experts in. So it wasn't something that they tried to do a, a, on their own. And they looked outside of their industry in order to get that expertise. Um, and they shifted entirely. So they didn't hedge and keep some of their business in dairy and some of it in the nut uh, milk. They completely... Um, ceased to produce uh, dairy, dairy products from cows and instead um, went into the, the nut um, vegan milk area. So what could this mean for you? What might this look like? So again, same deal. Um, we recommend that you look at your uh, strengths and weaknesses and have a think about the opportunities and threats that are potentially relevant in this uh, strategic response. Um, you do that individually as well as as a collective. Um, you then think about some of the actions that we might be taking um, and um, some of those things might look like finding new partners, um, thinking big, reimagining what your business might be. And then as an industry, um, what this really means is about having a clear vision and strong leadership, accepting that there is going to be some risk and you'll have to manage some potential short term loss. Um, but what's great about this is, of course, that you can still have separate P&Ls, but you will need to, to collaborate. And here's some of the, the potential implications for you as farmers. Um, so what do we do now? Um, we prepare for disruption, we monitor the signals, and we start uh, taking strategic action. Um, this means watching and monitoring those signals that I discussed at the beginning. Um, these are all available in the report as well. Um, and they vary depending on the scenario. And we also um, start to assess our individual capabilities, look at our strengths and weaknesses, collaborate as a sector and set a vision and way of working. So that is a whistle stop tour of a very detailed report. Um, I'm going to take um, 
the questions now, and Ricky is preparing those for me. Um, so um, the first question I've got is, um, how much energy does it take to make an alternative protein product? Um, we've actually had a similar question to this before where people were talking about um, to raise livestock, we use the sun, the sun's free, surely it costs more money to make these alternative proteins. Um, the thing that I would say here is that we don't know um, how much it costs from an energy standpoint, but what's happening is they're talking about the, um, the, the downside of raising livestock and the numbers that are getting thrown around are things like over 50% of greenhouse emissions are caused by the raising of livestock and the processing of meat for human consumption. So they're really not talking about the energy that they're using, but more talking about how bad the energy is um, that's being used by uh, the raising of livestock. Um, another question we have is, um, are these alternative protein companies actually successful now? Um, so if we've interviewed everybody um, who has these and um, the private companies, so we haven't seen their books per se, but what we can say is that we are seeing a lot of growth and that growth is coming from in terms of the distribution that they're doing, um, in terms of the number of consumers that are um, eating the product or purchasing the product in grocery, as well as the amount of investment that they're continuing to get. So as they're continuing to get these large amounts of investment, um, what we're seeing is that that usually suggests that they're hitting their milestones because they're continuing to get more and more funding. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that they're probably not profitable in the same way that you all are, um, but because their um, they're investors are being driven by philanthropic purpose, they're, they're willing to take a loss in the short term. But they are getting to some pretty impressive levels of commercial scale um, so my guess is they're not far off it. Um, are the alternative protein companies scalable? Yes, that, that they are. I mean, that's what we're sort of seeing. So um, Beyond Burger is the most ahead with regard to this. It's because the process is simpler than the likes of, for example, Impossible Burger. Impossible Burger have got to a regional commercial scale through the building of the plant that they um, have over in Oakland. They haven't got to national scale yet. And the thing is that it is possible that they will have um, some delays in how they get to scale because um, as I'm sure you know, it's a, it's a processed product. So as a result of it being processed, things can go wrong as you increase the volume and it requires more investment in R&D. However, the trajectory is that they will reach commercial scale um, and that would be looking at between um, five and eight years. Um, is an alternative protein just a mince substitute, substitute so it won't affect other cuts? So um, alternative protein is currently only available in mints. The technology can only produce a, a beef patty that's considered to be tasty and consumer ready. Um, there's a lot of investment that is going into developing the other cuts. Um, it's reliant on um, 3D printing technology evolving, um, as well as that's the big one, as well as some other um, R&D breakthroughs that are required. What I would say though is that all the scientists are telling us that they are really, really excited about the possibility of cracking, creating muscle as a as an integrated muscle system, like a cut of um, meat. Um, I think my favorite quote was one of the scientists said to us, a baby can mash up uh, plants to make a meat patty, but only a, a, a real scientist can create a piece of steak. And so they're all very excited and highly motivated to try and do that. It is, however, possible that they will never go into that, that they'll never crack it. And as I also mentioned, it is dependent on other technologies as well, being um, having some breakthroughs themselves. Um, is there a concern about alternative proteins not being natural and being a processed product? Um, there's definitely some questions that are being asked by consumers about that. Um, they are doing, the companies being, being Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger are doing a really, really good job and they've got a lot of money behind uh, selling the concept of something being made from plants, um, which um, is an easy narrative for people to understand. 
And there is a belief that if you eat plants, it's better for you and better for the environment, whether that's true or not is, is less relevant, but they're definitely it's, it's stealing those natural cues from plants. Um, what we are though seeing from, um, for example, people that are staunch vegetarians or that are highly clean eaters, they're less interested in things like the impossible um, burger because of the way it's made and also because of some of the ingredients. Um, but conversely, something like Beyond Burger is more widely accepted um, by people who have been vegetarian for a long time. Having said that, the way that both companies have positioned themselves and the way that uh, casual dining restaurants are using them is they're using them as an entry product. So as a way to try and attract people to becoming vegetarian and to moving away from meat. Um, it's, it is early days. Okay, so I think that is all of our questions. Thank you very much for um, listening. I know you had to hear me talk for a very long time, um, but um, it was a pleasure. Um, I hope you enjoy the report, that you find it inspirational and useful. And if you have any other questions, feel free to um, reply to that email and we will be sure to um, answer those. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. Have a lovely day and thanks again for getting up early as well. <laughs>